touch a little bit on application so people can can get a primer on that. If you okay. haven't dosed Kalkwasser's solution before, then it's sensible to begin with the method of using it to replenish water loss to evaporation. That, in that case, you'll have an idea of how much Kalkwasser you're dosing into the system. But as, as Chris has pointed out, and I have made this point a lot in the last couple of years, limiting the amount of solution entering the system as a factor of a function of pH is so important. Don't just set it up to drip dose and leave it alone. You just don't know, especially in the early stages, you don't know how, how your system is going to react. A pH controller is a part of so many monitoring systems now that people are incorporating. But even if you don't have a pH controller that's part of a bigger, more elaborate, more complex system, they're available. Um, many years ago, we used to use the uh, the pinpoint pH controllers, uh, the ones that you would use to control pH in a planted aquarium, for instance. It works the yep. same way. You just are putting your dosing pump in on the plug that would handle the low level versus the high level. Yep. These days, it's very easy to uh, use uh, your dosing pump, which can be a simple peristaltic pump or whatever kind of pump you want to use, a displacement pump, something like this, um, you you kind of want to use a pump that's outside of the system to ensure longer operation. Uh, you want to mix one to three days maximum worth of solution at one time. The longer that the solution has to react with CO2, the more calcium carbonate will form on the surface of the solution. It forms a little crust. And eventually, um, there will be calcium carbonate formation within the solution. And all of that serves to decrease the activity of the solution at the time when it's finally dosed into the system. And that's not what you're what you're looking for. Right. You can mix slightly more calcium hydroxide into the water than would normally dissolve. So I, I referenced 1.49 grams per liter at 77 degrees. Add more than 1.49 grams. Yeah, it'll provide It'll some excess material up. to interact with with the atmospheric CO2, and it keeps the remaining solutions solution more, more yeah, potent, more stable, more potent, more um, saturated. And, and Which, this is the critical thing. Mix it and allow it to age prior to commencing dosing. Dose. You want to let it sit for at least an hour. Uh, yes. This, this time allows any undissolved material that's, that is within the solution water column effectively suspended to uh, settle to the bottom of the dosing vessel. That's not what you want to dose. You want to dose the clear solution. And that's where you got to get crafty if you're dosing a massive amount of it into a system. 12 gallons, 15 gallons a night. <laughs> right. It, 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 it's, you know, do you remember when we were talking about it and how and what I came up with? Yeah, it's quite a quite a big quite a substantial yeah. volume i mean we were i used 55 gallon mixing vessels um and it 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 um we had um weighed out exactly what we were supposed to put in and it mixed up crystal clear the first time we did it it was cooler out at the time it was again it was in november and um i didn't have any settlement but then i thought about it and i'm like well what if i do eventually end up with some settlement at the bottom why how and what if I have an overabundance of dosing by the way I have my controller programmed because of a probe issue or something? And it gets down in there and dips into that slurry that's at the bottom. We don't want that. Um, we came up with a float that floats on the surface that covers the entire surface so it allows less atmospheric air to interact with the solution right. and only pulls from the surface, which is – the clear solution so it doesn't have to be pulled from the bottom like some people might have asked me it doesn't matter where you pull the solution from in the vessel that you have the solution mixed in it just matters that you're pulling the clear solution mm -hmm. if you have your 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 dosing line down in the slurry at the bottom because you threw you had more calc washer to the vessel than what you needed and it just settled to the bottom then you're going to be pulling all of that undissolved calc washer through your lines which can be a complete nightmare in time, it can dry out, you know, get hard, 
clog up your lines. I can tell you this, in two years, I haven't changed any of my Kalkwasser dosing lines. None of them. Right. They're all the exact same dosing pump heads and lines because I never let it get into that slurry. Mm -hmm. And that is key. And the lines aren't crystal clear, but they're – you know, I know that they're open because I've checked the, the, the volume that they're dosing and it's, I think, 669 mils per dose. And it's within like five to 10 mils of what, it's, was it, what it says is dosing. And that's two years and I've never recalibrated the damn pumps. Right. And that's probably within the operate or within the error that's allowed by the pump exactly. manufacturer. Yeah. And exactly. so, and, and, and a, to put all of this into context for, for viewers, <laughs> That's a massive amount of over two years, the amount, the volume of calc washer solution that you are dosing, the normal packed 100, 120 gallon reef tank, they're oh, not going to go through that kind of volume of calc washer solution in five years or 10 years. Right. So, so to, you do want to keep an eye on your pump tubing. You want to make sure yes. that it is, that there's still free flow of, of solution through those things, but figure if you keep just pulling the clear solution as opposed to pulling the undissolved yes. material, you will prolong the amount of time that all of that is going to work exactly without you having to mess around with it too much. And again, you know, with my application is completely different than a hobbyist application with, like you said, uh, you know, uh, if they had 180 gallon aquarium, um, you know, they might, the amount that they're dosing, their dosing pumps going to be running very slow. Mine, they sing. I mean, it is almost a liter in um, a very short period of time that goes through that dosing pump where most, most cases it's going to be dripping out of the end of the line. It's not going to be coming out in a stream like mine does. So that's very important to make sure that you're not make, you're not dosing any of that um, undissolved material at the bottom because the slower it goes through there, the better chances you have of it clogging up the line completely. Where I think if I ended up dipping down into it, it just pushes it through so quickly that I probably wouldn't have as much of an issue. But as a on a smaller scale, like I'd say 99% of the people that are going to try to incorporate this that I've helped out with, they're going to need to make sure that they're dosing strictly the clear liquid. I mean, it's I've stressed it. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of times to people the clear liquid is all you want if you're putting anything but the clear liquid i don't know what's going to happen i don't want to know what's going to happen because it could be not an issue at all it could be major issues down the road and who knows when that's going to be because there's too many variables involved with that whole process of undissolved caulk washer going into salt water yeah this is this is this this entire discussion uh, is is about dosing the clear liquid let's just be absolutely um, straightforward on that. Awesome. All right. So the, the, there are really just two points left for us to go ahead and cover. Um, one of them is the photo period or what, or how, how Kalkwasser dosing occurs throughout the photo period and when, when you are dosing it now versus when you, um, set off on this whole thing. And then the, the, the last thing we're going to talk about that's planned is uh, the limitations of calcium hydroxide and the use of other hydroxides and we'll just touch on that um, but uh, let's let's begin with um, let's let's just pause for a second and we'll we'll begin now okay okay so the last two points that are planned for us to cover with calcwasser dosing um, is the dosing in terms of uh, what point during the photo period makes the most sense, especially for a high calcium demand system. And then uh, the last thing we're going to touch on here is the, the use of other types of hydroxides. So beginning with the, the time that you are dosing Kalkwasser now, let's, let's just step back and look at when you first started to reincorporate Kalkwasser dosing into the the system husbandry. Let's start with that, and then let's go through the progression of uh, where you are now. What led to that 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 modification? Because I know that there was a modification that occurred. Yes, for sure. I mean, we used to just dose Kalkwasser twenty four seven on a drip, and. Um, you know, we were able to match our evaporation, but we weren't able to sustain the pH level that we were looking 
to sustain. And then the main issue was um, pH suppression in the non-photo period. So we then incorporated with, um, I think it was a thought that you had, was um, we can do controlled dosing with, um, with our apex um, and the pH reading on that with the dosing bumps. Yeah. So then the whole thing was, is um, how do we do that exactly? Um, and that was the f- only real issue that I had was figuring out exactly what I needed to do for programming to get the dosing to, um, to commence only when the pH was at a certain point in the system. So in the beginning, because our pH was so suppressed, we, you know, we were at like a peak of one, 8.15. So we started dosing, um, Kalkwasser with the, the average of that pH. So when the pH fell down to the average was when it started to dose. Mm. And then we had to figure out, okay, we need to get the evaporation rate exact. So with our apex is 24 hour programming. Um, if you wanted to just be dosing by pH. So we had to then figure out, okay, if we want to dose, you know, with us, we were dosing 12 to 15 gallons, um, is what we needed to dose, but we needed that to be dosed in the non photo period. Okay. So, on one system or throughout the entire facility, 12 to that 15 was just, gallons? That was on just one system. Okay, and give me the approximate volume of that system. Uh, 2,400 gallons. And give me a square footage idea of coral growing. Um, oh, gosh. 72 times 2. So like 180 square foot. Okay, but that's that's just including the surface area when you look down. That's not including the walls of the tanks, which we have corals growing on as well. So, it's a huge surface area, and of course, our conversations were the reason why my pH was so suppressed was because of the addiction that I have, and there's so doggone much coral biomass in there that it was very hard to figure out what was necessary to be done. Well, the great thing is that you. This this is this represents an example of an extreme where it's not going to be a situation that most people are going to encounter, and correct because th- they're not going to have that much coral biomass stuffed into a, a, a space like that, and so um, that will speak to the ability of the calcwasser to help you bring the pH up and. And, and on some level maintain calcium. And I do want to touch on alkalinity a little bit here before we get off of this topic, but okay. Sure. So, so go ahead. So you were doing 24 hour dosing and then you, you incorporated the apex. So we incorporated the apex and um, the programming was actually turned out to be quite simple on it. It was just a matter of, you know, putting your average pH in for that 24 hour period to slowly raise your pH value up by dosing your evaporation during that period of time when your pH was suppressed to that average pH. So that starts usually about an hour and a half after our photo period is over is when the pH gets down to that set point. So then it was dosing, but it was continually dosing because I didn't have the, the um, correct amount to be dosed set up in my in my apex. So because it's 24 hour dosing, we programmed in the, the, uh, rough gallons that we were, um, evaporating on a daily basis. And because it was only dosing in that photo period or non photo period, it was only a 12 hour period of time, Mm. but we were unable to actually obtain the pH average all night long because we were not dosing correctly because it was saying, okay, I have to dose 12 gallons in 24 hours. So here's what your dosage, each dose amount is X. Mm. So I then thought about it and said, since it's only going to be a, in that 12 hour photo period, I need to just basically double what my programming needs to say for the amount that is being dosed. That way the amount being dosed per dose is double what it would have been, which in turn then maintains the pH properly. Yeah. That was, that was the key breakthrough when we figured that point out because in the apex, it's in MLs. So we had it figured that we needed to dose around 43 to 45,000 MLs of calc solution to get where we needed to be 
And in turn, we doubled that to 90,000 mLs. So that made my dose go from 335 mLs every 10 minutes to 616 670 mils every 10 minutes and that doubling up then in turn kept my pH at the average and it only dosed the exact evaporation during that suppressed pH period. Once the lights came on and photosynthesis started occurring, that's when the pH naturally was rising above that average. Mm -hmm. So then what we decided to do was every single day we would have a new average because the pH would never go below the average that we had programmed. So every day we would raise that value up and it would go up. Uh, I think the first time the average was like 8.0 and then we went to 8.19, then it was 8.2 and then it was 8.25 and I couldn't get it to go any higher than I think it was 8.22 with just straight cockwasser dosing my average or dosing my evaporation. Um, Ian, that was even with it maximum saturated at, you know, the 12.4, 12.44 pH um, in the Kalkwasser solution. Um, and we started this in the um, colder months of the year. So the maximum saturation slowly actually went up a little bit because the water temperature of the um, RO water was cooler. Mm. And of course, as if anybody doesn't know this, um, the colder the water, the more saturation you can get out of caulk washer. So if you're having like a room temperature, you're going to be at like maximum, maybe 12.44. 12.4 is usually really good. And I find that that works really well. And if the temperature is above like 81, 82 degrees, and literally it can go at, at 80, you can get to the 8.4 mark. But as soon as you go to 81, 82, you can get maximum maybe 8.25 to 8.29 um, on saturation in caulk washer. Um, drop it two degrees and you're back up to the 8.4. It's pretty wild how that works. Um, it's uh, that was all I learned all that from you, Chris. I mean, I don't I learned all my chemistry from you. What am I saying? <laughs> um, but it's been uh, an amazing ride. And then, actually, the first thing that you and I talked about before I even actually incorporated the cockwasser into it was something you said you wanted to touch base here with um, as the second point. Um, for finishing up our topic on hydroxides, um, we started off with potassium hydroxide. And I remember laughing when you told me to put one drop every three seconds. Or no, every five seconds. I'm sorry. It was one drop every five seconds in 2,400 gallons. I remember laughing. Do you remember what you said to me? I don't, but I'm sure that it was something <laughs> along the lines of it's wicked, wicked stuff. You're like, um, it doesn't sound like much, but you better listen because this shit will mess your tank up if you oh, don't. Yeah. Do it properly. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> just to quickly interject, and I was thinking about this earlier today when I was thinking about our, our conversation. Probably, I'm going to say around 2000, I had, an, an, I, through through the course of the last 23 years, I've spoken with a g tremendous number of, of aquarium hobbyists who have had questions regarding various aspects of their systems. There was a guy that I will never forget. I had a conversation with him he had he had poured a cup worth of Kalkwasser. I was working for a manufacturer at the time. <laughs> I I probably I probably shouldn't mention the name of the manufacturer just for, for liability reasons, but or, but but they were they were reputable. But right. um the guy had dumped know, a cup I worth know. of Kalkwasser into a twenty gallon <gasps> reef tank, a cup worth oh, oh saturated Kalkwasser, and of course he killed everything. And he called and he said, This was our fault. We had, <laughs> and I said, you, "You did you read the instructions? Because the instructions clearly state how to make and and the person who had written those instructions was the owner of the company, meticulous, very sure that those instructions had been written to to cover all liability <laughs> aspects, <laughs> and so um, I'll give him uh, tremendous credit there." So right. clearly, so I say to the guy, you know, you, you, you can't do it this way. This has to be dosed on a, on a very gradual basis. It's dripped, it's dripped into the system. Now imagine Kalkwasser, and this is one of the things and lately, the last two years, there have been so many people who have contacted, certainly you, yes. me as well saying, you know, I, I know about Kalkwasser on a very 
um, precursory basis. I'm scared to use it because I've read horror stories uh, regarding its application and the fact that it can kill everything w without, w yeah. w you know, w with a with a quick screw up. That's certainly true. Y you can um, do that. You need to be paying attention to what you're doing. You need to read the instructions. And if you read the instructions and you're you're applying it in that in the fashion that it's intended to be applied, you're not going to have that problem. But Calquaster has that capability for sure. Yeah. Potassium hydroxide and sodium hydroxide solutions, you can take that up in order of magnitude. If you, first Just of all, a little bit. if you <laughs> dose one of those solutions too quickly into your system, it's it's curtains. I mean, it's going to be, curtains. it's catastrophic. I mean, so, I mean, so you can't do that. I couldn't imagine. I remember when I started the 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 potassium with you and you told me about the one drop every five seconds. I was laughing. I'm like, that's not going to do shit for the aquarium. And you're just like, would you just listen to me? This isn't something to mess around yeah, with because it is really, really potent, nasty stuff. And, you know, then we continue to talk about how they use it in um, meat processing plants. They throw the bones that they still have flesh on into the potassium hydroxide to continue melting the flesh off of the bones so that they can then send them off to a processing plant to make dog treats out of them. I mean, if that doesn't say stay the hell away from the stuff, then I don't know what does. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. you it, don't want to handle and this is the funny thing. People will look at this and it's kind of like they're dealing with something that's got this taboo of, oh, the experts use this. Listen yeah. to me, all of you. If you've never handled potassium or sodium hydroxide, Don't. caustic potash or caustic <laughs> soda, I wouldn't advise it. Um, uh -uh. If you're going to do it, be very, very careful because if it touches your skin, uh, especially sodium I... hydroxide, more so than, than potassium hydroxide. The difference being that potassium hydroxide is typically purchased in a in a in a flake form. So if you've ever bought hydrated magnesium chloride, it's very looks much like similar. that. It's very much like mag chloride hexahydrate. It looks very similar. It's not as dull, gray looking as 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 that material is. It's more white, but it looks like flakes, very similar. Big big flakes. Mm -hmm. By contrast, sodium hydroxide is pronounced in what they call a microprill uh, product material. It looks... it, they look like tiny little resin beads, but they're pure white. They bounce everywhere. They're, they're highly susceptible to static charge, so they attach to everything, plastic especially. Um, if that stuff gets on your skin, it will burn you immediately. Immediately, uh, yeah, and and I mean, I've got scars from handling stuff that I that I shipped to you, that I'll probably have the rest of my life, and I've had them for two oh, yeah. years. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's one trial learning, um, and I well, know you've had that experience as well. So, the bottom line here for all of you who are who are um, listening. listening to this for for calcwaster dosing for your reef system, you really don't have a need to go to. Potassium, potassium and, sodium. and sodium hydroxide dosing. There's just not a reason. If you can't get your pH high enough using those two hydroxides, or excuse me, calcium Cal hydroxide, Cal then the next suggestion that I would have would be if you're doing any strontium dosing, would be to consider strontium hydroxide, which doesn't isn't isn't as persnickety to handle. Does produce a it very high dissolve. pH solution. Well, it, it it's more soluble than than calcium hydroxide, but you don't need very much. Is the problem? Right. You know, you know, most people don't have a very high strontium demand. But that's kind of the outside next hydroxide that I would recommend you consider. Mag hydroxide is practically insoluble, uh, so there's no it's point looking at this. Yeah, yeah, it's I mean, it's not worth doing it, as you say. So well. You know, you you um, when you came down here when you were formulating the uh, anticipate, you left me with about I don't even know how much it was. It was a little vial about this big of strontium hydroxide. It might have been maybe thirty grams, forty grams of it. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember when we figured all that we dialed in the whole 
process of what we're doing with the um, the hydroxides that we were doing and i was very happy with the stability in my ph for i think it was probably about four or five months but then we started getting warmer again and i was unable to get that ph value in my calc washer vessels which are 55 gallons and i just you know you told me don't add more because it's not going to dissolve it's not going to raise your ph and of course i believed you the little guy inside of me said, dump some more in and see what's going to happen. And, it, and of course, what you said was exactly true. And then I remember getting on the phone with you saying, hey, you, you, you left me with some of this strontium hydroxide. My strontium level has been a little low. So um, let's try and incorporate a little strontium hydroxide mixed in with the potassium or with the, sorry, the calcium hydroxide in the calc vessel. And let's see what I can do. I was actually completely blown away at the, I think I put two, 2.2 grams mm. of uh, strontium hydroxide in with the calcium hydroxide and the pH went from, I think it was 8.33 to over, no, sorry, 12.33 to I think 12.56. Yeah. And it was 2.2 grams in 55 gallons of water. So I was like, holy cow, this stuff is potent. Right. Um, but I, I, never, I never continued with that because I had an issue then um, when Gene did get the ICP running, my strontium level was at like 15. And I said, uh uh. Yeah. Okay. It's supposed to be around eight, you know, was right. it seven, eight, or nine? So, and, and that range is good. I was like, I don't like this. So I decided I was going to back off and not do that. And I just dealt with the consequences of a low, uh, well, a max saturated warm cockwasser solution being dosed. And I just learned how to play around with my um, dosage of the potassium. Um, and then we ran into the other problem where I was having my potassium levels just kept rising um, slowly. Of course, this wasn't something that happened very quickly, but um, it was getting to the point where, okay, I have to do a big water change to, to get this, this, this potassium level down. And that's when I started playing with the, uh, the sodium. And then I decided, okay, well, I want the potassium because of the intensity of it. And I also... Um, think I need to supplement some sodium ions because I'm my system is so packed with corals that it didn't matter how much calc washer that I was dosing my calcium level was continuing to fall um every day I could see it with my apex testing and um but my, before you go on yes the how were the corals growing <laughs> during that time <laughs> I tell you what, you know, it was like Chris always, like you always said to me, how do your corals look? Mm. My corals looked phenomenal. I mean, we, we took our, 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 um, from fragging a mother colony of an Acropora, mounting the frags on a three quarter inch plug. It was around eight to nine weeks of, uh, of time before they were puddled onto the plug enough for me to want to sell them so that when I shipped them, they weren't breaking off the plug. And that cut that time down to five and a half weeks of gro the growth was almost twice as fast and that blew my mind and this is I mean, despite that... the fact that the calcium concentration is progressively dropping throughout this period because your reactor is not running and you're doing <laughs> all of this right so so that's the next that's that's the thing about alkalinity is, is so many people look at this and say my alkalinity is through the roof and i'm not and my my reactor is not running doesn't matter i mean this is what i've been trying to you know put out the people because you know the, the biggest misconception about ph and alkalinity is you need to keep them both at a particular area in your i say it's either one or the other you're either going to chase your alkalinity or you're going to chase your ph yeah. if you chase your ph you're going to save yourself a ton of money and your corals literally will thank you every single day that you look at them because they're just going to be happy because that ph value is up my alkalinity has is in any given system. I mean, one of my systems is 13.6. Another system, the calcium reactor is con running continuously. Um, and that particular system, I wasn't monitoring the CO2 bottle on it. And I actually wasn't even looking at my apexes one week. And I got complacent again and didn't watch my apexes. And that system's, um, the CO2 bottle went out on it. And my alkalinity went from a normal about 8.3 area all the way down to 6.2 by Monday morning. And I'm freaking out because I used to believe that alkalinity at 8.3 and above was keeping brown jelly away. 
And I got into my farm that Monday morning and went and looked at my euphilias, and they were just happy. I've never seen any euphilia fimbrophilia in an alkalinity of that low, 6.2, 6.5, 6.7 area where there wasn't some sort of issue happening with them. But then I thought about it more and said, wait a minute. The pH was completely suppressed in that system, so they were already stressed. And then you had your alkalinity value go down, so you stressed them out even more, which then brown jelly ended up taking over on some of them when you had a suppressed alkalinity and a suppressed pH. Now, alkalinity of 6.5 is not really suppressed if you look at natural seawater. I mean, it's pretty much pretty much where you need to be. Right. Um, but we as reefers keep our alkalinity, you know, higher. Mm. But I think we keep our alkalinity higher because we don't understand pH. I understand it. You understand it. And we're trying to talk to people and show them why pH is so important in a reef aquarium. And chasing your alkalinity is a money pit. And chasing your pH will save you time, money, and just be simpler. I mean, the, that's the bottom line with it all. I mean, uh, and you get such a great alkalinity value out of the calc washer and explain to everybody, I'm never great at explaining what happens with the reaction of calc washer being introduced to an aquarium that's got a suppressed pH with carbonic acid in it. I know how, I know how it works. You've explained it to me a hundred times, but I can never explain it properly. So hearing it come from you is going to be way better than hearing it come from me. Well, I mean, the simple practical aspect of it is that the hydroxide ions wind up driving the pH up and they combine with some of the weak acids in the system and they neutralize them. I mean, that's, that's effectively what's going on. There's more to it than that. But the, the fact that the pH goes up dramatically and the and the alkalinity goes up quite dramatically as well and that alkalinity is a result of the um, acid neutralizing capacity of the hydroxide it doesn't matter if it's from coming from calcium or or some other salt or some other cation um so what what it's what the calc washer solution is doing when it hits a system is the uh, you're not getting any ionic residue that you don't want it's not like dosing calcium chloride where the the calcium and the chloride have dissociated and now you have a solution of ions that are having weak interactions and the corals are pulling calcium out and the chloride concentrations continue to accumulate the beauty of the hydroxide solution the calcium hydroxide solution is that both of those things are being utilized in the system. The, the hydroxides are um, neutralizing some of those weak acids that are, that are present, whether they be carbonic acid or, or weak acids that are a result of metabolic reactions. They're helping keep that pH higher. The calcium is being consumed by all calcium um, utilizing organisms, whether it's calcareous algaes or coral or, or you know anything along those Sponges. lines. Sponges. Sure, absolutely. Speculoles. I mean, yeah. So, yep. uh, so um, that's that's the the beauty of it. It's just a matter of dosing it in a way that your pH remains within some range that you are defining. And so, um, the the alkalinity value of your system when you start dosing calc washer is going to in all increase. likelihood increase dramatically and 